Hello, and welcome everyone to Solving From Anywhere. I'm going to ask the host to turn my camera on. Uh, this is MIT's speaker series, and today is our inaugural webinar. I am Hala Hanna, Sol's Managing Director uh, for Community. We are thrilled uh, to have you with us today to be opening the speaker series with fantastic speakers and a very timely topic on building an inclusive future of work here in the United States. For those of you who may be new to Solve, welcome. Solve is a marketplace for social impact innovation out of MIT, and I hope you enjoy uh, the sneak peek into our community of social impact leaders and innovators. To our members and Solver teams, welcome back. It is lovely to see so many familiar names here. Solve's community counts over 120 member organizations who partner with Solve and are selected social entrepreneurs who we call Solver teams to achieve their social and impact goals. And we're lucky to count so many incredible foundations, corporations, and nonprofits among you. Okay, we have a packed hour for you today. Here's a program. Just yesterday, Solve launched a new challenge called Reimagining Pathways to Employment in the US in partnership with the Mortgage Family Foundation and New Profit. The challenge will identify, support, and scale promising solutions that accelerate pathways to current and future employment with a particular focus on those traditionally underserved or marginalized communities across the US. So our panel conversation is about setting the context for this work. Why this? Why now? Why us? And in the next hour, you can expect three things. You can think of it as three-part act. Uh, first, as a starter, I want to introduce you to one of our uh, solver teams, Dr. Gary Cooper, the COO of Ripley, and uh, Gary's life work is particularly relevant to today's conversation. Then we have our panel with our speakers for 20 minutes, and we will close the hour with an audience question and answer. So you can join the conversation by using the question and answer feature in the bottom of uh, your screen. And as you come up with questions, please input them there at any time. Okay, let's get started. I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Gary Cooper, CEO and co-founder of Ripley and Solver to our Circular Economy Challenge last year. Gary, welcome. Thank you, thanks for inviting me. Um, hi all, uh, happy afternoon or happy morning, depending on where you're calling in from. My name is Gary Cooper, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ripley. Ripley is a Chicago-based um, tech startup that's building technology to scale the circular economy. My story uh, starts kind of to Reefly starts in the lab. Um, some of you probably are, are researchers are, are inspired by scientific research. And one of the things that I noticed about six, seven years ago was that we were poorly underfunded in my lab, but we had so many resources that we were, weren't using. Um, and so long story short, I decided to start a program at my alma mater, Northwestern, um, which is just like an intramural sharing program. So if there are things in my laboratory that um, other people in, in the university could use, let's make that happen. Why? Because it reduces the cost to innovation. People don't have to spend new money. As well as something near and dear to our hearts at Reefly, it reduces waste. As it turns out, when we got, got started in 2015 and really started um, focusing in on problems around university uh, sharing, collaboration, and waste, we realized that some of the conversations and some of the use cases that we were exploring were generalizable to any business, whether it be a Fortune 500 company, whether it be an agency within the federal government, or whether it be a university. I'm happy to report that Replay's technology is operating reuse programs at places like MIT, um, all the way to places like Google, and all the way to places like the US Air Force. Um, and what we try to do is make that fun because we think sustainability should be something that everyone's both involved with, but that should have fun doing so. Um, and so not to take up too much more of the time, I'm always happy to connect and talk about circular economy and technology and what we're doing and how we can help large systems and large organizations. You can always go to info at rheaply.com or just go to www.rupi.com. Somehow you'll find me and I'll love to connect. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Every time I hear you talk um, about Ripley, it sounds like you've made another leap. And thank you for making a responsible consumption possible in a fun way. Absolutely. Um, 
with, with Ripley. And Gary, um, you are an African uh, American man in tech. You've been vocal about the uphill battles you face being an entrepreneur because of your identity. Yes. And this is a watershed moment in this country, uh, much Indeed. needed. How are you and Ripley reacting to this moment? Me personally, it's been a roller coaster of emotions about two and a half weeks ago for the very first time ever in my life i cried on a business call which was very strange so there's been um it's impacted me personally but i think um from briefly what we've tried to really do is go back to our core values and really understand how we can as a small startup uh, really affect global change and so one of the things that we're doing is working with the city of chicago to potentially stand up a, um, a scholarship or, uh, for, for people who look like me, for founders who look like me. Um, but um, beyond that, I've just tried to be very, very clear and vocal and helpful to organizations who are trying to institute changes around DNI recruitment, DNI um, um, efforts in their C-suite. Um, and I'll continue to write about those things and continue to be vocal because I think um, the more people we add to the economy, the better the economy is for all of us. And hopefully that system effect helps starts to mitigate some of the kind of historical uh, systemic racist uh, things in the United States. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Gary, for sharing this. And the rest of the conversation is very much about this. How do we build a system that is more inclusive? How can our economy's recovery uh, be more inclusive of everyone? And so is founded on the idea that everyone needs a space at the problem solving table if we are to, um, uh, to address the challenges that we face, whether they're local or global. So thanks so much for sharing this with us. And we'll, you know, we'll come back to you at the Q&A portion of this. Looking so for everyone uh, who's with us, don't forget to submit your questions to Gary uh, and stay tuned to hear his answers at the end of the session. Thank you, Gary. Absolutely. So we, we will now move to our next segment. We have three incredible panelists, each of whom dedicated to reimagining the future of work in the United States. With that, please welcome Dr. Angela Jackson, partner at New Profit, which is a venture a philanthropy nonprofit that backs breakthrough social entrepreneurs who are advancing equity and opportunity in America. Welcome, Angela. Hey, welcome. Next is Carrie Morbridge. Carrie is Chief Disruptor of the Morbridge Family Foundation, which works on a wide range of philanthropic issues from education to health. The foundation has partnered with many of our Solver teams and is a partner of Sol for many years now. And uh, welcome, Carrie. Good morning. Together, nonprofit and a new profit and the Morbridge Family Foundation are supporting this challenge that we've just launched. And our third panelist, uh, please join me in welcoming David Hall. David is the managing partner at Rise of the Rest Seed Fund, which is a fund from Revolution, the nationwide platform led by Steve Case, which spotlights regional startup hubs and uh, early stage investing across the country. Hi, David. Hi, how are you? Good. And uh, let's jump right into it. So yesterday we, we launched together an exciting new open innovation challenge, reimagining pathways to employment in the US. Carrie, can you tell us a bit more about this? Why this challenge and why now? Well, this challenge is so important to us and our foundation, because when you think about COVID and you think about the unemployment, you start to dig deeper into the roots. And there's actually 100 million Americans who are underskilled right now. They're working jobs that don't have upward mobility. They're working jobs that don't um, take them to a career pathway. And sometimes actually they're working full-time jobs and yet still need government assistance. So we hope to start changing the conversation about what is working in the workforce, workforce programs, and how education could take a huge pivot and not necessarily always focus on testing, but let's focus on what's working, let's focus on what's best for America, and let's put America back to work. So this challenge couldn't have come at a better time for us, um, and to be partners with MIT, to be partners with New Profit, to be partners with um, David and his team at Rise of the Rest. It, it's just like the synergy is there and the time is now. 
Absolutely. And I'm so looking forward to working together on this. Um, Angela, you have been talking about what it means to build an equitable workforce for a long time. And now this pandemic has just exposed how poorly our economy works for communities of color and other minorities. How do you see this challenge help build a more equitable uh, recovery and workforce? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I think what you said is definitely true. We knew pre-COVID that this workforce was not working for millions of people, especially people of color. I think what happened with this pandemic, right, is exposed to many people in a way that we just could not look away because we are sheltered in place at home. How like fragile our, our social safety net is, right? How many people who can't even afford a $400 shot, right? And these are people who are working jobs every day but not making a livable wage. So when we thought about the future of work, New Profit has been working on our strategy for two years. And I know the Mortgage Family Foundation, they were working on this way before COVID too. Um, it's something we wanted to address, but then COVID, I say always, took the future of work and made it the present of work, right? And it brought this kind of global mass attention to this problem and thinking about how do we take people who are now unemployed, and many of those jobs are not coming back, how do we give them access to new skills and better information? How are they able to learn and earn at the same time? Because we know that people may not be able to afford to go back and take four years off to get a degree or two years. What are the skills that they can get rapidly? And then what are the wraparound supports that they need? And, and one thing that I'm so excited about, about the partnership with MIT Solves is, you know, we're trying to look at overlooked talent, overlooked regions, the middle of the country, small cities, you know, still where there's a great divide and people are suffering, but there's no shortage of ideas. And we're asking those, those players and those people to partner with us, one, to tell us what they need, how they see themselves getting back to work, and what skills they have. And when we talk about upskilling people, we're not taking people without skills. People have skills. We're actually helping them think about how they translate those skills into new opportunities. Right. Uh, I mean, so, so many uh, nuggets of, of, um, of truth there. And, you know, the fact that it took a pandemic for us to see some of this is profound. Um, th this was important work before, and now it's become a condition for the survival of the social contract of this country. And I hear both you and Carrie talking about this, um, you know, getting the skills that we need. So David, for years, it was commonly, uh, commonly held belief that education is that silver bullet to solving poverty, building long-term prosperity, getting people up the economic and social ladder. Um, what, what do you make of that statement and where are we today? Yeah, I think, first, again, it's, it's an honor to be talking about these issues, and I think we need more conversations like this where we're talking about the immediacy of relief and upskilling opportunities to, to the 20-plus million unemployed and the, the millions more that are underemployed throughout our society. But to answer your question, I mean, I, I feel like the education has long been held and, and policymakers have long touted education, but I think education is the, the chronic condition. I think the acute condition which needs to be solved is getting people back to work and getting people working in jobs that can provide not only the living wage, but the, the, the upward mobility necessary to be able to uplift generations of their family into a better social standing. And I think that that only comes through looking at, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a technologist, I'm a venture capitalist. I, I look at the opportunity provided for by technology to create new paradigms and new opportunities for a lot of these workers to 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 look at life a little bit differently because the idea is a lot of retail jobs a lot of they they were in the past and so we're going to need to look at evaluate and establish new pathways to create opportunities for these people to be software developers or coders or or have new jobs where the the aptitude isn't necessarily found in a four-year electrical engineering degree but is found in on-the-job training, is found in, in, in very teachable and, and learnable skills that can be applied while people are maintaining a full-time job. And so it's, you know, it's, it's kind of going back to the apprenticeship days where you learn by watching, sitting next to somebody and watching, and if you have a question, you raise your hand. We're investors in a number of businesses, which I'd be happy to talk more about, that address some of these, these both 
both this upskilling challenges, but also and is equally important, like the recruiting challenges. And I think we're seeing now how a lot of this has been superimposed by, by a lot of the conversations that we've been having around equity and access. And I think that it's even more, more sort of pointed to have this conversation now to make sure that, that, that the playing field is level, whether or not you're a black man or a Latin, Latina woman, or you live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, or New York City, where those opportunities do actually equate to all. Yeah, and I just want to just get in there and say, you know, the future of work for me, when I entered in about two years ago, was always an upmarket conversation, right? We were talking about how do we get middle and high level executives, you know, VR, AI, automation. If we think about regular folk, right, who are just trying to put food on their table, you know, they may not be thinking about the future of work. So I'm always thinking about whose responsibility is it? to inform them about these careers that they may have never been taught about. I know that when I went to high school and college, many of the careers that my friends have, even the job that you have, David, like I didn't know anyone that had your job. So how do you even know that that exists? So I think one thing that we think about at New Profit is where, how do we reach people? We're thinking deeply about going into community. Um, we're looking at investing in workforce boards because pre-COVID, that's where one in 12 Americans went to be upskilled, to get career advice and navigation. And if you go to some workforce boards that are doing an amazing job, some other boards that are located are, are, are sharing outmoded training. So how do we partner with local entities to bring that future of work to those communities and talk about these careers and pathways, to your point, that could be available through apprenticeship where they could come out of high school, college, you know, making 36, 40, $50 an hour. So that's the conversation I want to have, um, how we can get people back to work in the short term. Right. And, and uh, Angela, I definitely want to go back to that, uh, you know, the working boards and what you see their role um, to be in, in this challenge and in this context. And Carrie, I know that you, uh, you know, reimagined pathways is something that you think about a lot, this, you know, the reinvention, the pivoting of the education system. Um, and obviously now there's this sense of urgency uh, about, you know, during this pivotal moment. So uh, t tell, tell us what you mean and, and how do you envision uh, that you know, change from the antiquated models to something that hasn't even been invented yet, as, as Angela was saying. So to Angela and David's point um, about Americans being underskilled, I am that girl. I am that starfish. Um, I went to college when I was 36 years old. I had two kids in middle school and a loving husband to support me, and I could afford not to work and you know, go back to college and something I loved. I'm, I have my degree in fine arts for interior design. So I think being an interior designer has given me, and being that starfish, that person that needed that chance to become, to, to reach my fullest human potential, right? Because that's what we're talking about. How do we lift up America and how do we reinvent something to have people reach their full human potential? And with that, um, I think that's when we started looking for disruptive um, programs that are different from the norm. And believe it or not, in America, we already had some really great programs. Um, we used to call it VoTech for the last 20, 30, 40 years, and now it's called CTE for um, Community Technical Education. But what CTE changed is that you could start going in high school so we're great partners with Rankin Technical College. We're great partners with Gateway Technical College. We're great partners with Emily Griffith. And these are just a few. I think this prize is going to help us reinvent more of these programs. These programs are working because there's a thousand person wait list and they're not just for high schoolers. They're for any age, for any person that wants to come back and be re-upskilled. The other thing that we discovered when we were hunting for how could we help America get back to work is a new program is coming out. It's called Merit America. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, everybody needs to look at it because it's scalable and it's happening now. And then we also have to talk with corporations and what is their corporate social responsibility? And some people are, have been having that conversation for a long time. And I, I want to give a shout out to Starbucks and Amazon. If you are working at Starbucks and Amazon, you also have an opportunity to go to college or to find your pathway while you work. 
And that's what's so important here that Angela was talking about is how do we upskill people who already have skills, but we have to do it while they're working. People cannot afford to quit their jobs. So we're at this amazing time where I think we can break barriers and we can invent something new because everybody is hungry for it. And this conversation starts today here at MIT. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. So it sounds like there's the upskilling of those who uh, still have jobs and that's, you know, that you, you've highlighted a few ways that this can be done. And then there is the unexpected insight that maybe this is the best time to start a business, right? Many of the traditional barriers are gone. We're out of jobs anyway. It's easier to hire great people. Um, we don't have office rent to worry about. And there's this huge sense of need and purpose. Um, so I think research out of the uh, Kaufman Foundation shows is that more than half of the Fortune 500 companies today began in moments of recession and, and market decline. So uh, does that, Angela and, and David, and maybe starting with you, Angela, uh, does, this, uh, does this resonate as another pathway, uh, maybe in addition to obviously the upskilling? Absolutely, and it's, it's really part of our theory of action in New Profit. So one is we want to develop new technologies that attach and connect people with new skills and also good information about careers that are out there. But we also want to uplift entrepreneurs who are in their community because you think the people who are in the problem are going to be the ones who are going to be closest and more apt to solve it. So thinking about entrepreneurs who are sitting at home right now and thinking about you know, lack of data, lack of uh, information, lack of internet, they may have ideas that again, could have a lot of merit in today's moment. And so that's why we're partnering with XPRIZE on the Rapid Reskilling. You know, we want entrepreneurs to tell us what are their ideas? What does rapid reskilling mean to them? You know, what types of skills are there? And I also want to break out the paradigm that it just has to be technology. I think Carrie said something that was really important about going back to school um, for interior decoration. We need a way to connect people to their passion and what lights them on fire. And how do we do that in a scalable way? I think technology is the conduit to do that. There's an organization that's called Advanced by PPI. Um, it, it connects teams and opportunity to you to careers in the creative industry. Again, we need to think about how we broaden that aperture, let people know that, yes, you can go find a job, or you might be able to create one yourself. And I think that's a true sense of agency and empowerment. I, I'll just piggyback on that because I think Angela's right on. I think, you know, Holly, to your original question, I mean, FedEx, the, the notion that we would need an overnight delivery service for paper was begun in a recession. Uber, you know, hailing a taxi, you know, on your phone was begun in a recession. And so the ability to answer and ask really big audacious questions about what the future of our economy needs to look like. There are people in classrooms in colleges and universities in prison and lots of places contemplating these issues right now. And the idea that they, you know, that they sh can, should, and will have the opportunity to like dive in and, and sort of pursue this is, 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 is it's imperative on us who are looking at thinking about these problems funding some of these these issues these solutions for us to really dive in and support these entrepreneurs and i do want to i want to double click because i you know i'm a, I'm a technology in investor but i do want to double click angela on what you said because there we also need to widen the aperture and really think about little e entrepreneurship you know i as as much education and as much access as i have when I need a plumber or an electrician or an HVAC repair person, like those needs are urgent and those jobs pay very well. And, you know, I think we always need to think about, you know, the ability for people to, you know, most entrepreneurs are working someplace else right now and they need, they need the confidence, but they also need the access to funding, access to capital, access to um, high quality tools and learnings about business and opening up a business account and getting business credit to be able to start on their own. And, and when we can do that, we're, we're creating businesses like plumbers that make a lot of money for a lot of people and provide some really urgent services uh, across the board. And, and again, I, I hate to use one, it is, there is no plug and no electricity and no Wi-Fi required for that job. But, but when you're in need of it, you're in need of it. I think I've heard Carrie say before uh, that she... <laughs> You, you, Carrie, do you want to say it? I would, I would call my plumber before I would call my attorney. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and to that point, Carrie, the, the robots are coming for the lawyer's jobs just as much as they're coming for the call center's jobs. So as we think about the importance of upskilling, you know, while a lot of people who've gone to law school will be able to afford to self upskill, the people who are working in call centers, you know, they, they we're investors in a business out of Baltimore called Catalyte. Catalyte gives every applicant a test and it figures that about 10% of the US population is has the capacity and the aptitude to be a software developer. You know, these are jobs that 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 are making double the 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 sort of salary that a lot of the people who walk into the their platform making, but they're able to walk out on the other end working for some of the best brands of our time as as coders, as developers building applications. And so I think that we you know, we shouldn't bias ourselves against what, you know, what, where you've come from. And we should, we should, as a society, start to remove sort of the box checking that, you know, these jobs require four-year bachelor's degrees when there's an experiential component that can really qualify you to take advantage of these great opportunities. Right. And, and sorry, I'm please. just going to get on there. Just one thing. I just, I'm so excited about this conversation. Um, when you talk about like broadening the box, I also just want to put a plug in for people who have been formerly incarcerated. I came across through an organization called the Workers Lab that really centers innovations for and by workers. And it was a formerly incarcerated person who came up with the idea of the forestry, the forestry and fire recruitment program. As you know, in California, they use a lot of inmates who are actually fighting forest fires when they come out of work, when they come out of being incarcerated. Um, they can't get jobs with fire departments. So we set up a program to help these individuals get jobs, making regular hours and uh, wages doing the same type of work. So they, they were able to gain this set of skills while they're incarcerated, and now they're able to come out and make a living wage by doing it. So again, you know, when I'm talking about proximate entrepreneurs who see opportunities that others may not see, a lot of us who hadn't been in his position may have not known that that was a real opportunity to make a living wage for a group of people who had been disconnected for a very long time. That's a thank you, um, Angela, for for um, kind of anchoring us in that uh, in that concept of proximate voices, proximate entrepreneurs, those who really are from the community and will come up with the solutions that are needed by this community. So that's. Um, uh, that's really very powerful. Um, so I, we've touched on so many things. I want to make sure also that we bring in uh, the rest of the audience here. But it sounds like we, you know, there are multiple mismatches that uh, we we want to close. Whether it's at the personal level, at the company level, at the education level, and the policy level, uh, if we want to crisis proof, uh, you know, our, our our workforce going forward. Uh, for employers and cor corporations, it's about. Uh, Angela and, and David, you mentioned rethinking how which employers um, uh, are worthy to invest in. Uh, rethinking, you know, entrepreneurship in the small, you know, just the big E. Doubling down on the job training that supports these non-traditional learners and allow, uh, as you said, Carrie, to learn and earn. Um, if for the policymakers, it's about building that agility to respond to the times that we're in, to build the skills for an unknown career, um, as you said, rather than a degree that that exists today. And then for philanthropy, I know uh, uh, Angela and Carrie, you work, you talk often about philanthropy oiling uh, the, the, this machine through incentives um, and using it as a lever for, for the system change. So the system pieces that have to come together are many and each of us have a big role to play uh, because often marginalized people in the system will not always have the agency to make the decision making uh, to, to get themselves in that uh, upward mobility. And I, I'm, I'm quoting Angela here. Um, so so let's, let's look at the uh, uh, chat box. And, and in the meantime, um, uh, maybe an out of the box question for, uh, for Carrie. Uh, Carrie, you just became a grandma. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, what what do you hope for uh, for your grandchild when you know when twenty years from now uh, what kind of workforce do you foresee they will be living in? Oh, um, so I am just grandma of Elio. He's uh, four weeks old. Couldn't be more excited. I am Grandma Carrie. That is my name. So everybody can refer to me now as Grandma Carrie, and I will answer. Um, my hope for Elio in the future is that there's no biases of no matter what race you are, and there's no biases of what your sexual preference is. 
I think that those are both of our modern day times is that Elio is going to grow up in a beautiful family, a loving family like most of us, where he's going to be exposed to everything. As for a job, the interesting thing is, I can clearly say, I don't think his job has been invented yet. And that's why I'm so excited about MIT and this prize. I think we're at this pivotal place, like the industrial revolution was so important. I think we're gonna call, the, and I hope we don't call it the COVID phase, but I definitely hope that Elio finds purpose with his passion to make money. And those can both be intersected by the way. And so I think um, in the job market going forward, it would excite me no better than to see corporations that come together that aren't just doing good for profit and good for investors, but also good for their communities and good for their employees. And it can both be done. I mean, Cisco is a perfect example of, and Microsoft of how their employees get involved and how their employees get back. And they're not just purposely driven around this. And even Dr. Gary Cooper, I think he would, he would tell you that his job is more purpose driven about how do we connect people together easier and better. So to answer your question, it is that Elio's job, who's one month old, has not been invented yet. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, I think that that resonates with with a lot of us. Thank you for um, uh, for for this vision. And uh, David, if I may um, direct this to you, how do you see uh, the current um, racial equality protests shaping the future of work? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's 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 complicated, but I think on the margin, we're seeing a lot of progress come from this, and I think a lot of people who haven't listened, have their antenna up and are paying attention to what's going on. I think what, what you know, as, as the protests sort of move, you know, broaden the scope from just sort of police brutality, which is awful and needs to be addressed and discussed, but into like pathways, I think what's gonna happen is you're gonna start to see greater demand for public-private partnership to start really leaning in and addressing these problems because they're not they're not just, you know, to be borne by the, the policymakers. They're not just to be borne by the corporations and the, and the business community, but it's gotta be a collaborative solution that says, you know, workforce development is everybody's problem. Just like, you know, just like the, the, the Silicon Valley dream of of you know every 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 one job created in technology equals six general economy jobs like somebody's got to be there to support the creation of those six general economy jobs right and so i do think that you know mayors governors county executives they're all paying attention to what's going on and they're thinking about the pathways of their their you know their 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 population, their constituency. And I, I really do think that you're gonna see more change happen. I think the biggest thing that we've got to safeguard against is making sure that there is an equity layer involved in everything. Because even the, you know, the, the, the equity issues of creating the public transportation routes inform who can take which job where. The biggest obviously is childcare. Who's going to care for kids if if there's if there are continued interruptions in school, and and how do we make sure that the, the rights of women to have some access to these jobs who are usually primarily the, primarily the caretakers of kids have still these access points and these opportunities because it, it just it's the the larger diversity and inclusion lens has got to be consistently widened and and that's that's only when you know there are more women there are more people of color that are at the table helping to lead these conversations and drive these conversations and so i think again we're at any one and it's going to take several several time years for this to continue to play out but i you know i'm i'm an optimist by 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 orientation and i think that tomorrow will obviously be better than today and i think that we're seeing the acceleration of progress and and sort of like significant change being moved forward and at least not not just called for but demanded and i think that 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 you're i, I think it's going to be a long time for that quieting to happen if it ever happens 
going to be a long time for that quieting to happen. Uh, thank you, David. And you you spoke a lot about public-private um, collaboration, which I think is is you know just so crucial for this. And Angela, something that you that is also very top of mind for you. And you were talking about work boards. Um, so maybe if if we can take a few minutes uh, and and if you can tell us more about uh, how New Profit uh, thinks about workforce boards uh, and how you think their role will be in the post-COVID uh, recovery. Yeah, well, a, a couple big things. One is, um, for those of you who don't know Workforce Board, they're like quasi, depending on what state you're in, uh, government entities. They're funded by federal uh, dollars, state dollars, and some philanthropy. Um, and again, pre-COVID, it's where one in 12 Americans went when they were looking for a job to be upskilled, where many Americans have to go to validate um, and confirm for their unemployment check. So they are seeing an influx of individuals who've been displaced by COVID. Um, a lot of those boards, some of them are very innovative, like the San Diego Workforce Partnership. Some of them are on a journey to, um, towards innovation. And what we see with this challenge is to help work with those entities where a vast majority of Americans who have been impacted by COVID will go. It'll be like, the, they're like the first place they will go to look for jobs, that we actually invest money and de-risking technology for them, investments in technology, and that's what the dollars that we're missing from New Profit will do. Two, that we introduce them to new technologies and solutions that can help people in their communities get back to work. And these are gonna be the ideas that are coming out of the pathways MIT solves. Challenge, these will be the ideas that are coming out of the X Prize challenge. And really, you know, the way that New Profit looks at investing in our philanthropy is that philanthropy is risk capital. Our idea is to de-risk trying new things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we want to get evidence and proof behind them that we can then take to our policymakers, that we then can take to companies and say, look, we can show you evidence that this actually works. And coming out of this challenge, our goal is to put 25,000 people back to work. It's ambitious, it's bold, but it's showing through this radical collaboration, through philanthropy, through corporations, through academia, the power that it's going to take for an equitable recovery. And this is just one model. We know that we're going to need this in multiple times 10 to really address the need that is out there right now. And to Angela's point, um, we're working with My Colorado Journey, which is a partnership with Workforce Board, and they're having amazing results. So even if people are just watching this, I mean, contact Workforce Board for your own state and see how you could add your in my words, courage money, which is your philanthropic dollars. How do you invest in your own state? And this is something that is working. These are the conversations that we have to have more of. And it's just so exciting. You can see why Angela and I love each other because <laughs> we're sharing the same synergy of what we need to do to get America back together. And in our humble opinion, it's not up to the government to solve our problems. And for those of us who have a little extra jingle in our pocket, this is the time to put that jingle to work and use your courage money, your philanthropic dollars to make positive change. And then government can come in behind once you prove that it works and make it sticky. They can make it sustainable forever. So it's definitely a public private partnership that we're always seeking out because that's how it's gonna be sustainable in the future. And, and I think the one thing I would add, because we one of the things that we've done as a part of our fund is we go on these road trips where we go to dozens of cities and we compare and contrast. And the thing that we see is that there is no pride in authorship. The people who've done a really good job want to share it and want to give you the roadmap. And, and I think that the hubris of saying, no, no, the San Diego way or the Washington DC way is the way to go is really hurting Americans. And the ability to say, you know what, let's try what worked in Tampa, let's try what worked in Nashville and see how we can appropriate, not all of it, but the parts that we can appropriately localize to our community or to the challenges that our community faces and, and, like, and, and, and take two steps forward, even though it might have us taking a half step or a full step back, at least we've advanced the conversation and advanced the opportunity to, to a lot of these folks. And David, you're exactly right. And so one outcome that's going to come out of this challenge and collaboration is that we're going to partner with workforce sports in five states, and we're actually going to create those playbooks um, that they're willing to share, not only just the technology, but also the process to integrate it, because next year there'll be new technology. And part yeah. of it is paying it forward and helping that region, that city that might be next door to you, 
and open sourcing that information. So you're spot on with that. Uh, right. Thank you so much. So we have so many questions. I was trying to multitask and, and uh, <laughs> figure out how they fit into buckets. Um, I think so we're going to move to the Q&A uh, portion of this. Uh, we can also bring back now uh, uh, Dr. Gary Cooper, Gary with us, um, so that also if there are questions addressed to him or you'd like to enter anything, um, uh, we can also hear him. Um, so so uh, the first, there's a bucket of questions around reaching the underserved, uh, you know, educating the young adults in underserved and marginalized communities on technology and on the skills that we think are, um, are needed. So how do we do that? How do we reach the underserved? But also, how do we bring jobs to these communities? And particularly, how do we convince corporate America to move away from uh, the centers uh, of Silicon Valley and New York and maybe even Boston um, to, to this untapped talent? Uh, who would like to take that? I'll start because I, I, I think that, you know, there, there isn't anything like the urgency of now. And I think, you know, if you've been holed up in a one bedroom apartment in midtown Manhattan, or in San Francisco, moving back home has never looked better because you'll have the opportunity to go outside. And so I do think that we're seeing a lot. And one of the things that we've seen and started to track is the boomeranging of a lot of talent where people say, and they vote with their U-Hauls and say, you know what? It's been great getting, you know, a couple of years of experience in New York or Manhattan or, or, or San Francisco or Boston, but it's, it's time for me to go back home. And it's time for me, you know, you see a lot of returning, uh, returning citizens from, from incarceration, uh, veterans coming home, and they, they don't go back, they don't move to, to big metropolitan areas. They move to places like Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, and, and when they move there, it's up to us to be able to say, you know what, you, you might have been a bomb detection specialist in, in Iraq. When you come home, we're going to figure out what jobs you would be most appropriate for, because it might be working, you know, installing fiber optics. It might be doing, there, there is a comparable job for that. And it's up to us to help figure those pathways out. So I think that talent, talent is, fl is flexible and moves. I mean, as, as, as you see natural challenges like coal plants shutting down, those folks have to be reemployed. And we've got to figure out the best way to, to help support that. And, and yeah, we're, we're, I, I know we're investors and in, in a lot of businesses that are helping to figure that out and happy to talk more about that. But, but the goal is really to, 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 to help move that talent, make that talent a little bit easier to, to transition to a different geography. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I like to think of it, um, a lot of not so great things have come out of Corona, but I like to call it one thing that has been good, the Corona bonus, is that we all have been sheltered in place, right? So we've seen that remote work is possible. Companies who never thought that they could go remote have gone remote. I think that that's going to open up opportunities for people to live in different places. We were, we're reading articles now where people who had lived for Silicon Valley for years are thinking about moving out of state, moving other places. And companies are like, this makes sense. And that's also going to open up opportunities for people, one who didn't have transportation, didn't have the cost to maybe live in Manhattan, New York. So I think that's one way that we're going to get to communities that hadn't had the opportunity in the past, which I'm really excited about. I think the separate thing is with us being stuck at home, I think about the other bonuses, we become empathetic, right? So what we're seeing is this like coming together of what I'm calling the left behind. Millennials who've been priced out, who have five, six, seven roommates, right? Who are not seeing a pathway to economic security. Like they're also realizing, right? That their American dream is far to reach. So I think in total, we're all thinking about what we need to do in this moment to make it more equitable for everyone. So if we design and do it for the people at the margins, it literally is going to improve everyone's economic outcome. Well, and I wanna piggyback on that. We haven't really touched on the K-12 model yet. And we have got to see policy change so that all Americans have choice of where they send their children to school. It's as simple as that, but yet everybody seems to make it so technical. Mm -hmm. Our kids need the highest and best quality education and we keep talking about that, but there's all these barriers to allow that. Now has never been a time to make K-12 more agile, more resilient, and have more options for parents, but it's about how do we change that conversation to let parents know that they have the option for choice. Super important. And Carrie, I can't go without saying before we move on, I mean, we, we need to know that we had this huge major digital transformation and there's still 19 million Americans without internet, right? So let's think about those children who went online who don't have devices 
they don't have connectivity. Like we really do have to think about K-12 because it's where it starts, right? Those early years and, and things like going six months without having access to a computer or technology, we're, we're pushing people further and further behind. And, so and so what, solvers out there, please, this, these are one of the issues, some of the issues we need to think about real time. Yeah, and actually one of the, the things that we've been working on to that point, Dr. Jackson, is that um, even if you had access to the internet in the south side of Chicago and Baltimore, you're still gonna need the equipment, yeah. to your point, to log on to the internet, right? And so at the exact same time, we see uh, companies like Twitter and, and Square and Facebook talking about evacuating, ever having another office. So, so what we're seeing is there's gonna be a lot of idle you know, keyboards and monitors and computers at offices like that are no longer staffed because their workers are remote. And then you're gonna have people who are trying to get into the internet economy, who are on the South Side of Chicago, who need that equipment. And so I think we as a community and we as a society have to think about how do we move remote work home, but then how, how do we also then allow other people to access that? And I think there's a solution embedded in reu reusing those idle um, things that are already in the office um, in uh, affected communities. I think Dr. Cooper just perfectly put a prize where solvers could talk about how to get A to B. It's, it's, it's sounding like we need the next Uber of education and Uber yes. of office buildings. So yes. I'm ex that's why we're so excited about this prize because everything you just said is about an MIT solve prize. Yes. Gary, it sounds like you're going to apply again. <laughs> but <laughs> for, for the innovators who are out there, I hope you're finding this. Uh, there's a lot of nuggets here of things that can be done and that are so needed. And uh, I just want to repeat uh, this. I, th I think, Angela, you said it. When we design for the margins, we will include everyone, whether it's the, you know, the youngest, the most marginalized people uh, of color. So that's, that's what we've got to keep in mind. Um, a, lo a lot of questions, which is also super exciting. I'm, I'm barely keeping up. I hope I do justice to, to those out there who are who are asking um, th there's a bucket of questions around the cost of education which has become a barrier to many um, and and trade schools and vocational education programs that are becoming more prominent uh, in the US so how do you see uh, what, what what's the role that you see for these kinds of programs in retraining and, and upskilling um, definitely I'll take this one um, first there's there's an amazing amount of CTE, career technical education services out there that are very low cost. But if we're not talking to the younger generation about dual accreditation, which means that you get to go to college and high school at the same time, and that is paid for, if we're not having that conversation, shame on us. So let's start there because that's already a program that's in place. In at Colorado Mountain College, you can go to college as early as ninth grade and you take a PE course. But what it does is it gives you that uphill trajectory that I belong here on a college campus and, and I belong to, to earn a degree of some sort. And then we can talk about you know, how to the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, Verizon is doing a great job working with Merit America to open up jobs that four-year college applicants aren't taking, but they have a huge upward mobility in, like David said, in encoding, in IT, and it honestly requires maybe a six to eight week technical program, and a lot of our vets are primed to work at Verizon's entry-level jobs. So the, there are lots of things out there we need to have a million of these conversations. And that's why I think this prize, and I don't know if we've mentioned the prize money yet, may I? Please. <laughs> okay, well, there's $650,000 out there in prize money, and hopefully we'll get some of our other philanthropic investors to join with us so there will be more prize money by the time we get to the finish line. So we need to have this conversation a million more times. And I just wanna thank, Angela, Dr. Jackson, for her huge contribution to the prize money. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your partnership, um, uh, Carrie and Angela. By the way, we have people from South Africa, from Nigeria, from Lebanon, wow. lots from the US. Just so you know, I hope your, your, your message is reaching the, the globe. Um, 
so the, the, uh, we've spoken a little bit about this and maybe yeah, building on this uh, prize uh, money and the, the idea that philanthropy is risk capital and is the risking investments. Um, there are some uh, questions that are coming around the idea of risk and the risk aversions of some corporations to take a risk uh, on, on someone or on an idea. Um, how, how do you, what are some of the mechanisms to, uh, to de-risk and to convince especially in this time that now is the right time to, to, to be taking risks and taking risks on both people and on approaches. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll start. I'll just start with just really quickly. I think especially about philanthropy, even investing, right? Um, someone told me early on when I first started my first company, um, people give money to people they trust. And a lot of times people trust people who look like them, right? So I think it's really imperative on us as investors, as philanthropists, as employers, right, to really interrogate like our unconscious bias. We need to interrogate who is in our network, who do we feel most comfortable around, who do we not feel comfortable around. Because unbeknownst to us, those are guiding a lot of our decisions. You know, you'll hear an investor, they talk about pattern recognition. I use it a lot. If you're using pattern recognition, many times you're going to be choosing people who look like you, who are similar. And so if we want to spread opportunity, if we want to take risk, one is like we need to understand what, what we're risk averse to and why. And we have to actively push against that, specifically in investment and philanthropy, when we see that such a small percentage of the capital is going to people of color, to entrepreneur of colors when we know that they're disproportionately impacted. So it's almost like we have to have a reckoning, right? And ask, why is that happening? If logically we know that and we see the numbers, then we know that there's something else going on and then we have to push past that so that we're, again, moving outside of our friend network and our pattern of recognition into really thinking about who's gonna be the most impactful entrepreneur, solution solver to actually do this job or to invent or to invest in. I, plus one to everything that Angela said, I just, I, I, I want to flip the question a little bit because the thing about corporations, they are risk averse for everything except the salt solution to their problems. And so, the, you know, the, the old standard line in venture capital is always build an aspirin, not a vitamin business, something that somebody's got to take. And if, if and, and this is a call to action to the people that are listening that are working for companies where you know exactly what your company's main problem is, start a company to solve that. And your first client will be your, your former employer. So in that way, you've solved their problem and you've created your own sort of pathway to entrepreneurship right there. And so I think that like really encouraging people to think strategically as opposed to very linearly about sort of both their career path or their company's strategic objectives and say, are there ways, are there technologies, are there people that I know in my network, are there lived experiences that I've had that can solve this problem like that? And then that's your, that's your ticket out. That's your ticket to start that company. And I'll tell you, the best way to prove, disprove risk aversion is customers. Because if, if, it's, if, if it's your company's problem, it's also your top competitor's problem as well. And if you can't get, the, if you can't get your company to buy, I'm sure you can get your comp company's competitor to buy, and, and there you're off to the races. Yeah, and and to, Dave, to the spirit of David's comment, I actually think uh, you need to weight the risk, uh, the, at least the assumed risk. I think it's more risky for a big corporation to not be investing in DNI right now than not to. Um, the, the evidence is overwhelming that diverse teams are higher performing. Companies that have diverse boards, our returns are better. Um, and I would say in the millennial generation that if your company looks homogeneous, you might really have a problem with churn of high performing um, uh, workers and employees. So I actually would think that um, there is another risk the other way and not actually diversifying your employee base. The, the risk is bigger by not, um, by, yeah, by, by not diversifying. That's, that's a great point, uh, Gary. And um, I love the very concrete advice on, you know, the, this is a reckoning for us all. We all need to be deprogrammed and reprogrammed for anyone who's hiring. And then David, uh, build an aspirin, not a vitamin business and solve your employees employers problems first they'll be your first client those are those are terrific Carrie would you like to add anything to that I think one of the things we haven't touched on um, and this would be to our solvers and it was to my point earlier is that culture and when you're making a new business is critical to your success so right David we can solve a problem and we can get them to solve a problem but it's also how you treat others 
and how you treat your community and how you give back. So don't forget when you're thinking about solving problems, there's more to it and, and culture is the top thing that we look for when we're making investments in um, young entrepreneurs and in young programs to get launched. Hmm. Th thank you, Carrie. Uh, Gary, if that's okay, I think this is uh, probably one of our last questions. And I, sure. I wanted to ask you, because we're talking about uh, you know, the importance of diversifying. And you, you, how do you, do you have um, thoughts on how we can build supplier diversity in the manufacturing field, which of course will continue to be a huge chunk of this economy? Yes, we're working on that replay. Um, so I probably can't capture it all in a couple of minutes, uh, um, but I'll try, I'll, I'll try my best. I think one thing to do is to let more people into your supplier base. So one, one way to do that, I know there's a lot of diversity supplier programs out with big corporations and government systems. I recently wrote a brief in Forbes about how we call a minority owned business. That definition definitely needs to updating because it, it actually excludes a lot of minorities from being diverse suppliers, which mm -hmm. then doesn't allow you to get, to be working um, for, mm -hmm. for a big system or big organizations. So I, I think one thing is uh, easy and structural. I think the other is how do, um, how do we reach into the small business communities um, in our communities and get those suppliers supporting big multinational companies who are in a mile or two radius of those small businesses. I think we're working on some ideas, others are working on other ideas. And so I think to Carrie's earlier point, we need a thousand ideas and we need to try all of them. Um, because if we build more resilience in our small business community, of which there are many minorities, builds resilience for our whole economy, not just for minorities. So I think there's some updating to do with diversity supplier definition, definition, but I think there are other really cool ideas that we're working on in the tech space. Thank you, Gary. Anyone wants to, anyone has any final thoughts before, before we conclude this? We have a couple more minutes. Yeah, yeah I so will. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm always taking it over you. So I was just going to say, we, um, in addition to MIT, we, we are, we, when I say we, New Profit is funding the Future of Work Grand Prize. And so I would just encourage to everyone go to go to the Future of Work uh, New Profit site and see both links to challenges. All in all, we're giving away almost $6 million to innovators who are thinking about solving these problems. We have made a public commitment that we are going to give at least 40% of those funds to diverse entrepreneurs, people of color. Um, and so we want all the ideas. We want them not from the usual suspects, but we'll take them from the usual suspects. But please, I would encourage you to go to New Profit site. I would encourage you to apply. You can apply to both XPRIZE and MIT Challenges. And we look forward to working with you. It's just an exciting opportunity. I'll just add as a, as a final comment, my career in technology got started in Kendall Square, right outside of MIT, uh, where I was hired by another African American to be a junior technology executive at Akamai Technologies. And it, it, as, as much as we're talking about starting big and, and thinking big, I think that there's something really, really sweet and perfect about starting small. And that's hiring an intern of color, hiring a, a, a woman intern to come into your corporation or company or organization and start teaching. And, and, and this is the, all of our businesses are apprenticeship, apprenticeship businesses and people are watching us. And I think that we should make sure that those doors are open and we should tax ourselves to look for people different from us. I had a, one, of our, one of our great companies was um, sending around an email. They had a great sales call, but they were looking for somebody who spoke Spanish as a natural, as, as, as their first language. And that was a job. And they didn't have anybody in their company who could do that. And so the ability to, to, to like look for those, that, those pockets of talent to bring that into their company could really start you know, generating more revenue for them. So I guess we, it's great to talk big and have great audacious goals, but I think starting small by hiring somebody that doesn't look like you to come into your corporation or company or organization is a great start as well. Great. Well, let's do both. Um, this, <laughs> this is a great conversation. Thank you. The crisis has exposed the vulnerabilities that were some invisible at the very highest level. And building back better is a daunting prospect because the economic devastation is big and the loss is big. But really, there is no other choice. This is a moment of 
unlimited possibility, as I think uh, all of our panelists have very well outlined, because it's a crisis we haven't seen before. Um, thank you for sharing, for helping us look at the facts head on, but also think big about how we can fix it. And uh, we're hopeful that with partners like you, we can, we can get it done. This problem isn't going to be solved away by one entity, but all of us together, we can do something about it. Um, so thank you for everyone who's been with us. This wraps our first Solving From Anywhere webinar. And we cannot wait to have you back with us on July 7th for uh, the moral leadership uh, to solving work challenges with Jacqueline Novogratz, the founder and CEO of Acumen. Please stay in touch. Thank you so much for all of our speakers and let us know how we can work together. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.